Watching the game of bid whistles is like going to the Apollo on <laughs> amateur, amateur night. night. <laughs> there is a magic to this game that makes it the black national pastime. Oh. Where did that queen come from? I think they cheat. <laughs> Throughout our history, black Americans have, with great ingenuity and imagination, created a world with its own values and rules. A world defined by unfettered racial self-expression. A world behind what W.E.B. Du Bois called the veil. So first impressions, uh, the black and white footage that they're actually using, using in this opening shot was shot by a man named Solomon Sir Jones. We actually talk about him in our film, Uncle Tom 2. What Solomon Sir Jones's footage shows is this entrepreneurial spirit that black people had in the South in the 1920s. Strong, intact families, churches, pro-American spirit that existed in the black South. You see the 4th of July parades where they have American flags on and so forth. That's actually the byproduct of Booker T. Washington's teachings. And I think that's probably going to be the biggest contrast between Uncle Tom 2 and what PBS is doing. And it's interesting that these two films are coming out two months apart. Our film talks about who Booker T. Washington was and what his teachings were. Their film appears to be talking about W.E.B. Du Bois and what his teachings were. It's interesting how they will give credit for what Booker T. Washington did and taught. I mean, I mean, this footage, once again, is the tangible... Uh, uh, result of Booker T. Washington's teachings. But rather than giving him the credit, they're giving it to W.E.B. Du Bois talking about the veil. That's something that people should take into consideration. And another thing I, f I find interesting is how he says that that success was due to black self-expression. A world defined by unfettered racial self-expression. And so what these people tend to do is they credit left-wing pro progressivism for the freeing of the slaves. They credit people like W.E.B. Du Bois for the black success that existed in the South, even though W.E.B. Du Bois was a man who hated capitalism, who hated Christianity, who hated religion in general. When we talk about networks of black people, we're talking about different types of associations. There's a social type, fraternal and intellectual organizations. How were each of you shaped by black social institutions? Again, this reinforces what I was just talking about. They're crediting the intellectual organizations for the success that existed in black America throughout the 20th century. It wasn't the intellectual organizations. The intellectual organizations were actually antithetical to black businesses, were actually antithetical to uh, black entrepreneurship and the black uh, growth that we saw at the behest of the Negro Business League, the Tuskegee Machine, people like Booker T. Washington. In fact, I have a book right here. Um, it's called The Miseducation of the Negro. It was written by Carter G. Woodson. And in it, he talks about how the upper echelon of black intellectuals are going to Ivy League schools like Harvard, like Yale, like Princeton and the others. And they're being taught by professors who don't have any or who have never had uh, any experience at all in business, but yet these professors are teaching these black intellectuals that because white people dominate America and because capitalism is bad, the Negro has no chance of toiling upward in the United States of America. But Carter G. Woodson acknowledges that the poor so-called uneducated Negroes in the South are actually at work doing the very thing that these miseducated intellectual Negroes are being taught can't be done. And so even Carter G. Woodson acknowledges the fact that the intellectual black class were a detriment for real progress of black folks in this country. I grew up in African preschool. I didn't learn Snow White in the Seven Dwarfs. I learned Cold Black in the Seven Simbas. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously that was meant to be a comical moment. Oh, I didn't learn about Snow White. I learned about, you know, Cold Black. And... It, he's saying this in jest, but the fact of the matter is I, I personally looked into these one room schoolhouses and these uh, predominantly black schools that existed prior to the 1960s. And what I found is that these students were learning uh, the classics. They were literally learning the classics. It wasn't about blackness. It just wasn't. 
It was about truth. It was about uh, preparing these black students to go out into the world and make something of themselves. What they're asserting is a narrative that all we as black people do is obsess over our blackness. And we make blackness God, and we want to impart that God to our students that they might grow up being so infatuated, so intrigued, so led by blackness that they can't even see, you know, past their own nose. What does black joy mean to you? Black joy means being in a safe space and feeling free, where you can really be yourself and shed that skin. Wherever you have a large concentration of African Americans, you have business districts that rise up, that meet the needs in these communities. Annie Malone. So two things stick out to me about what we just saw. One, when he asked, what is black joy? There is no such thing as black joy. There's joy or there's no joy. Another thing that I think is interesting about this is how the woman says that whenever black people are in one concentrated place, you have business districts, you have uh, all this success. If that's the case, then what happened to Baltimore? If that's the case, then what happened to Detroit or any of these other uh, inner cities where you have so-called food deserts, where you have uh, able-bodied people standing on the corner doing absolutely nothing? If it's true what you're saying, I'm, I'm just going to give it to you. If it's true what you're saying, that when you have a lot of black people in a concentrated area, you have all this success, then please explain to me South Side of Chicago. Please explain to me all these places. It's important to note that she's talking about this in the present tense. She's talking about this as though this is what happens right now when black people are in a concentrated area. But the footage that they're actually showing you is what happened back then as a result of their Christian ethic. And the collapse, ironically, of these thriving communities happened whenever people began to insist on their blackness. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Black is beautiful, black this, black everything. It's whenever we began to take the onus and the responsibility off of ourselves to be people of integrity as a manifestation of our Christian faith, that's when we saw the collapse of our communities. Madam C.J. Walker, basically, developed hair straightening. Was that a good thing for black beauty? Part of our magic is that we can do anything with our hair. I can straighten it. I'm still going to be dope Julie, black Julie. Black social net. So I'm starting to see a theme in this. She's talking about how her magic is in her hair. It's indicative of what we point out in Uncle Tom 2, which is blackness is a new religion. And whenever you make blackness your religion, you're going to get confusion. You're going to get chaos. You're going to get crime. You're going to get all these things. Because guess what? The people who are asserting what the relics of blackness is are not black. It's white progressive types who are at the head of Hollywood. Who's at the head of PBS? Black social networks, black institutions, they are like barrier islands. They protect us from the storms of this country. When we come together. Okay, so while they're saying, you know, black institutions, which gave rise to black success in America, they're at the same time showing images of protesting. And then they cut to a shot of Jesse Jackson, who is an absolute radical. And so, again, this kind of goes to the confusion that PBS is putting out there. They're conflating the success of groups like the Negro Business League with the protest groups that were actually setting us back. So for PBS to try to conflate the two is very dishonest. What time is it? So what happens when we begin to see the deterioration of black institutional life? There have been people who've argued that our community was better off before integration. When I was growing up, everybody in my sphere was black. There was just that sense of everybody in this together. I think we've lost that. When we look now in the 21st century, we see many of the same issues our black foremothers and forefathers faced. Economic disenfranchisement, anti-black violence. 
How was I able to start a business in my 20s? How are any of the black people in this country who are doing well able to do well if they're facing the the so-called anti-black racism? If you're open and honest with yourself enough to admit that right now isn't as racist as she says it is, then how can you believe her or any of the rest of these people with regard to how racist it was back then? This is the same rhetoric. These are the same images that PBS have been putting out there for years. Economic disenfranchisement, anti-black violence. No justice, no peace. But we're facing them without many of the institutions that black people had to sustain them during the first round. I constantly am thinking about what it means to occupy my identities. I do surround myself with blackness. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I just don't understand what she means by that. Uh, what do you mean by we're having to face anti-black racism without the help of the institutions that existed long ago? And why you're saying that you're showing this image of the NAACP. The NAACP is still around. Black Lives Matter, which they call themselves a global network and has many local chapters across the country, is still around. You have these institutions. And so, again, she's lying to your face. And it has the backing of PBS, which is partly funded by tax dollars, who are validating the lie that she's saying. You have your organizations. The fact of the matter is your organizations are a detriment to black people and are a detriment to America. Constantly am thinking about what it means to occupy my identities. I do surround myself with blackness. As long like this person looks like a crazy person. I don't know what's going on with their hair and they have this thing in their nose and she's talking about blackness and surrounding myself with blackness. This is a mental illness that we're not talking about. It really is. This is a mental illness and she has devoted herself to the religion of blackness. Again, not blackness as it naturally is, but blackness as it's set forth by white Marxists. As long as race counts in America, black networks and institutions will always matter. From the founding of- Who said race counts as long as race matters? Who does it matter to? It matters to you more than it does to the people that you are trying to get us to hate. It matters to you more than anybody you're talking about. And so it's all in your head. It's a paranoia that you have. You're projecting your paranoia and your own insecurities onto the larger society. And you want society to placate you. You want society to accommodate you. You want politicians to pander to you. Prince Hall Masons to Black Twitter. African-Americans have forged networks in their own image as the ultimate act of resistance and survival. Henry Louis Gates ought to be ashamed of himself. He's too old to be to be putting stuff out like this. What I encourage people to do, watch Uncle Tom 2, because we're putting out a narrative. And then watch Making Black America by PBS, because they're also putting putting out a narrative. We actually use some of the same footage. We're honest about where the footage comes from, from our perspective. We're honest about who shot the footage. They're simply using these images and talking about something else because they need these images to validate their lies. Watch both narratives and decide for yourself who's being honest about our history and who isn't. When you look at these pictures, you get a sense of what black life was like. Some of them look pretty prosperous. Divine Providence was clearly operating in the lives of black Americans. Throughout history, black folks were honorable. They had integrity. That's what black people were. We were never taught that America was bad and that we were not Americans. We were raised to love America. Protesters topple a statue of Christopher of Columbus and hundreds of statues have been vandalized. You see people trying to rewrite history. The American people know these names have to go. Why is that? Whenever you have something to be proud of, 
people have less of a chance of controlling you. This country is racist from top to bottom, from right to left. And for black people to become a part of that is for them to become, in fact, anti-black and to hate themselves. There is no country in this world that a black person would rather be. Unless, of course, they grow up in this country. You broke the contract for 400 years. We played Then game. they're fed a lie that is so deceptive. The reason that that lie exists is power. There are certain people who are using the Negro in order to establish that power in Washington. And the Negro is just merely a pawn in a game that's bigger than he is. <laughs>